Okay, so I'm going to get started because I have, well, according to this, I have 49 minutes and six seconds left, and I have a well 49 minutes and six seconds worth of material to get through. So this talk is about modularity and what is happening in JDK 9, specifically around Project Jigsaw. Project Jigsaw, which has been around for quite a long time now. Now, in terms of what I'm going to talk about, I want to start by talking a little bit about the way that the APIs in Java are being changed in terms of their structure. This is actually quite important because it's probably the thing that's going to have most impact on your code. Modularity is great, but the way that the API structure is going to change is going to be the thing that will hit you if you've done some things in your code which perhaps you shouldn't have done. But we'll kind of get to that. Then we'll talk about what Jigsaw is. We'll talk about the ideas of modularity from a Jigsaw perspective, which is different to some other ways of doing modularity. We'll talk about how you can develop code using modules and the way that you can use the things in Jigsaw to modularize your own application code. We'll talk a little bit about application migration from the point of view of taking existing code in jar files and how do you make it run on top of JDK 9 using modules. A little bit of advanced stuff. I want to talk a couple of things about the way that modules are represented and also some of the things to do with the class loader. And then we'll just kind of summarize at the end. So to start with then, the structural changes to the API. Now, if you look at Java, the platform, you will find that there are these core class libraries. And way back in JDK 1.0, there were about 200 classes in rt.jar. And I remember when I first picked up Java way back 20 years ago, 21 years ago now, actually, and I thought to myself, oh, this is good. There's a nice set of APIs, and there's about 200 classes. That's enough that I can actually hold them all in my head. So I can, I can know all the APIs that are available. Now, if you zip forward to now and JDK 8, you'll find that there's well over 4,000 classes in the standard class libraries. Now, this is very good because you don't have to write your own list class. You don't have to write your own SQL statement class. You don't have to write lots and lots of different things. They're already there for you. But clearly, it's not possible to hold them all in your head at the same time. Well, I can't certainly hold them all in my head at the same time, which is why you know, documentation and the ID is very useful. Now, if you look at the way that the classes in the rt.jar file have evolved and have been designed, you will find that there are a large number of publicly accessible APIs which are intended for public use. They are intended for you as developers to make use of them and to develop your code. Two of those are, or two of the big packages are java.star and javax for java extension.star. Now, these are the ones which are defined by the JCP, the Java Community Process, through the specific JSR, Java Specification Request, and they are what is called Java SE, Java Standard Edition. There are also some other APIs in the standard class libraries which are intended for public use. And you will find that these are in packages like com.sun.star or jdk.star. The reason that those are there, they're not part of the Java SE standard, are, is because they are things like some of the things you would use for tooling. Uh, if you're writing an IDE, you might want to be able to interact with the, the JVM and the compiler. So there are things there which are not part of Java SE. And then there's also some things around projects like Nashorn, where you've got JavaScript integration. Again, they're not part of Java SE, but they are public APIs. Then there's a whole bunch of other APIs. These are the ones that were put in there in order to allow the public ones to be developed. So there are a number of classes there which are private APIs, unsupported, not intended for public use. Now, right from the very beginning, the developers of Java, whether it was Sun, whether it's Oracle, have always been very public about stating that fact. They are unsupported and they are not intended for public use. Most of them you will find in the sun.star package. And the most famous of those, or infamous, is the wonderfully named sun.misc.unsafe. Now, I don't know about you, but there's kind of a clue in the name of that class, unsafe. 
So you shouldn't really use it. Anybody here used unsafe? Ooh, not many people were actually admitting to it. Right, but we'll talk more about that. OK, now, from a compatibility point of view, Sun and then Oracle have been very concerned with backwards compatibility, which is a very good thing, because as a developer, there's nothing worse than taking code which works on version X or version N of the platform, and then moving it to version N plus 1 and having to change it to make it work, because it already works. So really, from a compatibility point of view, if you have used the standard publicly accessible APIs, the idea is that you can take your compiled code on version N, and you can run it on version N plus 1 without any changes. And realistically, you have to go way, way back to sort of 1.0.2 to 1.1, where things did change and broke backwards compatibility. But because Java was very new, not many people really noticed too much. Uh, I actually found out last year because I did a presentation on 20 years of Java, and I tried taking some applets which had been compiled on version 1.0.2, I think it was, and tried to run them on JDK 8. Some of them would actually run, but some of them, because the class file format had changed, wouldn't actually run. So there was a, a binary incompatibility. The other thing that the developers of Java have always said is that they reserve the right to remove publicly supported APIs but they will give you advance notice. And if you look from JDK 1.1 onwards, there is the deprecated tag, the deprecated annotation now, which allows you to see that these things could potentially be removed in the future. And I did a bit of research, and I found that if you look at JDK 8, not quite sure which update it was, but there are 23 classes which have been deprecated, 18 interfaces, and 379 methods. Of those, how many do you think have actually been removed? None. Absolutely zero. So that's very nice, because it means that backwards compatibility is maintained, and we don't have to worry about the fact that these things haven't been removed. But it does lead to some issues around, you know, sort of bloatware, shall we say. Now, JDK 9. JDK 9 is introducing some incompatible changes, which means that these are things you need to be aware of in terms of migrating your application from JDK 8 to JDK 9. First of those is around encapsulating the internal JDK APIs. So these are the ones which are not intended for public use. And we're going to talk a bit more about that, so I'll, I'll come back to that. A small number, six to be precise, of supported APIs, which were highlighted in Java SE 8, are going to be removed. So these are the first six APIs that really will be removed from Java in JDK 9. These are all around property change listeners, um, so you may or may not have used them. We'll discuss a little bit later on why those six have been targeted out of all the thousands that are available, and why those six in particular are being removed. The binary structure of the Java runtime and the JDK is going to change. If you rely on particular files being in particular places, then that is going to have an impact on you. There is a new version string format. Now, I'm not going to talk about that in this presentation. It's, you know, it's a fairly minor-ish change. But again, if you rely on the format string being a particular way, then you might have to change your code to actually change to adapt to that. And the other thing that's um, a minor thing, really, is that the fact that a single underscore will no longer be allowed as an identifier in source code. So hands up, who's used a single underscore as a variable name? Ooh, nobody. Oh, one person at the back there. Now, I thought, when I first did this presentation, I thought, yeah, single underscore as a variable name, that's a bad idea. No reason why you should want to do that. And then somebody came along and said, well, actually, I have, but I've got a very good reason for doing that. And he said that if you use a Lambda expression and you have a variable in the Lambda expression which you don't use, then you use an underscore, just to kind of hide that variable in terms of the Lambda expression. I thought, yeah, that actually is quite a good reason for doing it. But anyway, in JDK 9, you won't be able to do that anymore. Two other things which are being removed in JDK 9, again, in terms of compatibility, might be an issue. One is the endorsed standard API override mechanism. Uh, this is primarily used by people like app server vendors because they need to override some of the standard APIs. Um, so most people won't find that an issue. And the extension mechanism. I'll come back to that towards the end when we talk about some of the class loader stuff. 
And primarily the reason these two things are being removed is because with a module system, they're not actually required anymore. You can do the same thing using the module system. So let's talk about the binary structure of the JDK and the JRE. Now, this has been documented. Um, some of the later, more latest versions of the JDK are already rolling this out. So you can actually see what's going on. Um, there's a JEP, JDK Enhancement Proposal, number 220, which outlines exactly what these changes are. If we look at before JDK 9, this is the structure in terms of the file system of the JDK. What you found is that you had a number of directories in your Java home, which would be things like bin. And bin would contain the Java compiler. It would also contain the Java runtime, the key tool, the server tool. There's a whole bunch of things that go in there. And then there would be a lib directory, which would have the tools.jar file, which is used by the, the tools, funnily enough. And then there's a separate directory, subdirectory, called JRE. Within JRE, there's a bin directory, which contains exactly the same things that are in the JDK bin directory, just less of them because it's the runtime only, so there's no compiler. Uh, there's a lib directory, which has the rt.jar file in it, and so on. The idea was that you could separate the JDK from the JRE um, as two distinct units, but it's really kind of merged together. If you look at JDK 9, now we have a flat directory structure. There is one bin directory, so one copy of Java, one copy of key tool, one copy of all the things that are in both those bin directories in earlier versions. There is a lib directory which doesn't contain a tools.jar file and it doesn't contain an rt.jar file. This is where the modules which are being or have been created for JDK 9 are being stored. So we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit about that again later on. And then there's also a conf directory. This is new because in the old style of things, there were several files which you could legitimately change to modify the configuration of your JDK. But they were kind of spread around, and it wasn't always easy to see which ones were the ones you could change versus the ones that you shouldn't change. So now all the ones which you can potentially change are in one directory, conf, to make it easier to see where you can make changes. Right, so unsupported APIs. Now, Oracle did a big survey. They took a lot of their source code, things like Fusion middleware, things like Java itself, and they looked at which APIs, the internal APIs, they'd used themselves, where potentially you know, they shouldn't really have done that. Although you could argue that because Oracle you know, are the custodian of Java, then they're entitled to use all of the APIs. Anybody want to guess what the number one most popular unsupported API that Oracle had used was? Shout it out, come on. Unsafe. Unsafe, yeah, actually, no. It was Base64 Encoder. Base64 Encoder was the most popular API that they had used, which was unsupported. Number two was Unsafe. Anyone would guess what number three is? I'm only going to go to three. Come on, it's obvious. Decoder. Decoder. See, it's kind of weird, isn't it? Because like, you know, they, used, they must have encoded a lot more data than they decoded for some reason. But anyway, this shows that there, there was a lot of use of these internal APIs. So something had to be done about that. So what they did was they decided to classify the APIs based on their usage. So these are the internal APIs. And they came up with non-critical and critical. The non-critical ones were divided up as basically ones which had little or no use outside of the JDK. So if they were so kind of esoteric and so specific to JDK functions, then they were considered non-critical. The other ones, things like Base64 encoder, decoder, were only used as a convenience, because up until JDK 8, there was no public API for Base64 encoding and decoding. Now there is, so we don't need to worry about that so much. And then there's these critical APIs. And these are the ones where the functionality that they deliver is so difficult, or actually just downright impossible, to replicate outside of the JDK. MISC Unsafe is a great example of that because it allows you to delve down into memory, access specific memory addresses, and you just can't do that with standard Java code. Now, the original proposal for how to deal with these was they were just going to take all of those internal APIs and encapsulate them with the module system. The idea was, well, we've been telling people for years that they shouldn't use these APIs, so we'll just say, right, 
we're not making them available in JDK 9. You were told it's your problem to resolve. That didn't go down so well. A lot of people said, well, you know, I know you told us not to use them, but, well, we did. And lots of people have done that, and there's lots of frameworks and lots of libraries out there that use these APIs. So it was going to be a real problem if they just suddenly made these APIs disappear. So JEP 260 is the way to solve that. And what they're saying is that in JDK 9, they will encapsulate all the non-critical JDK internal APIs. So these are the ones we don't really kind of care about because there's either an existing replacement or they're just not ones that people really use. Then they're also going to encapsulate all critical JDK internal APIs for which there is a replacement available. So as long as you can change your code to use something else, then those APIs will be encapsulated as well. They won't be available in JDK 9. The rest of them will not be encapsulated. So specifically things like MISC Unsafe will still be available in JDK 9. So they kind of backtracked on the idea of doing that. What they do say, though, is that they're giving you notice that in JDK 10, or possibly later, they will take these APIs away. But again, they will be replacing them with a publicly accessible, publicly supported API. And that's something which there's a lot of discussion going on about how best to do that. But that's post JDK 9, so we don't need to worry about that just yet. In terms of the APIs that you can still access, but you have to put a command line option on to say, I really do want to use these um, unsupported APIs. So unsafe is obviously one of those. There's also a couple related to signal handling. So if you want to do something like intercepting a you know, SIGINT control C and not have your JVM stopped, then you can do that with the signal handler. There's SunMist Cleaner, which is really a different way of doing finalization. So you don't actually have to use a finalized method in your class and have it pushed you know, outside of the garbage collection normal way of doing things. And then there's a couple related to reflection. So these are the ones which will still be accessible in JDK 9, as long as you put the right command line option on there. In order for you to understand whether you use these APIs, they have provided a nice little tool called JDEPS. And this was introduced in JDK 8. It's been improved in JDK 9. And there's even a Maven plugin for this as well. What you can do is you can take your jar file, you can ask JDEP to tell you what internal APIs are being used, and it will give you a list of the various APIs that you're using. And then you can look to see whether there's any that are suspicious or any that you should be thinking about replacing with other ways of doing things. Um, this is very good because often what you find is that your code may not use these APIs, but you've got a jar file from some third party, and you look at that and you go, oh, actually, they've used MISC Unsafe or something like that, and so you need to be aware of that. Okay, let's talk about Jigsaw and the module system, what that actually involves. First thing is what the goals were for Project Jigsaw. And I've kind of divided this into two sections because this is one of those things that's quite a, quite a big sort of philosophical and, and even technical discussion. First couple of lines is that they wanted to modularize the core Java platform, so the core libraries. And that's because it was getting very big. You know, we went from 200 APIs in JDK, or 200 classes in JDK 1, and now we've got over 4,000 in JDK 8. And that's getting too big, it's getting unmanageable. What they wanted to do was break it up into chunks so you could say, you know, I want the desktop APIs, I want SQL APIs, I want logging APIs, whatever. But I don't want Corba, for example. You know, anybody still use Corba? Oh, one person. Okay, well, yeah, you're the one. Um, <laughs> so it was, it was the idea of trying to get around that kind of issue. So it was breaking up the JDK into more manageable pieces. There's also a lot of talk about this, this makes things more secure because it reduces the attack surface of APIs that people can try and get at. It improves maintainability. And you know, there's a discussion about whether it improves performance. So you know, startup time, you're not loading all these classes at startup time. You can get your um, system to start up faster. I'm a little unconvinced by that argument given that you know, we're talking about a difference between, let's say, 50 megabytes and 10 megabytes of data to be loaded at runtime. And you know, modern systems, it doesn't actually take like several minutes to load 50 megabytes of data anymore. So that's, that's one thing. Then 
the second set of goals that they had for Project Jigsaw, where it gets a little bit more kind of debatable. Simplify construction, deployment, and maintenance of large-scale applications, and eliminate class path hell. Now, I'm not totally convinced whether these were good goals for Project Jigsaw. Modularizing the JDK itself, breaking up the class files in the RT.jar, great goal. But whether they should have attempted to also introduce modularization for application code when you've got things like OSGI, well, yeah, it's, that's definitely something that can be discussed. Now, modularity in terms of specifications has been around for a long time. There have been a number of JSRs. There was JSR 277, which was the Java module system, kind of like OSGI that was withdrawn a while ago. There was JSR 291, which was a dynamic component support. That came from IBM. Um, then there was JSR 294, improved modularity in Java, which was, again, withdrawn. And now we have JSR 376, which is the Java platform module system. And that, this is targeted for JDK 9. I've said no promises. Actually, I think we're pretty certain that it will go into JDK 9 because if you look at the open JDK source code base now, all of Jigsaw, basic Jigsaw support is in there. So unless they actually back all those changes out, then it's going into JDK 9. Um, there'll be a new JSR. In fact, there is an hour Java SE 9 JSR available. That's going through the review process and will be going to the expert group shortly. Then there's a bunch of these JEPs, which are related to that. So there's JEP 200 for the modular JDK, JEP 201 for modular source code, modular runtime images, encapsulating the APIs, which we already talked about, and the module system itself. Let's talk about what we really mean by modules then. So the fundamentals of a module is it's a grouping of code. Now, if you think about it in Java, we already have ways of grouping code. So they're called packages. You can take classes, classes group together methods, they encapsulate methods. You can then group together classes in a package. So a module is really the sort of next level up. It's a way of grouping together packages that are relevant to each other. For Java, that's what we deal with in terms of module. But you can also have a situation where you want, might want to include other things. And again, we'll kind of come back and talk about that in a bit more detail later on. But you could potentially, in your module, put native code if you wanted to use JNI, you want to have native libraries. You can put resource files, you can put configuration files for things like properties, for things like translating messages. But essentially, what we have is a collection of packages. So I have created an example module here, which I've called com.azul.zoop. In there, I've got a number of packages, well, I've got two packages, alpha and beta, and those both have a couple of classes in them, name, position, animal, and zoo. Great. How do we declare a module? Well, to do that, what you do is you create a modulinfo.java file. And the modulinfo.java file needs to go at the top level of your package structure. So it goes in the unnamed package, in effect. What you do in your module info.java is you create a definition for your module. In its simplest form, that is just module, name of module, and an empty set of braces. Now, immediately people look at that and go, ooh, hang on, now does that mean that module is now going to become a reserved word in Java? Now, I've used module as a variable name. Do I have to go back and change all my code? And the answer is no. The way that this works is that it looks like a Java file, but it's not really a Java file. It gets compiled by the compiler, the Java compiler, but it's not really a Java file. So in the case of module info.java, you don't have to worry about it really being Java. We called it Java so we can use the Java compiler to compile it into a class file. And the class file can then be put into the module, and that contains the information about what the module is. So what we also find is that we need to have the idea of dependencies. So one module may require things, packages, classes from another module. And so we can, we can define that within our module info.java file by saying that this module, zoop, requires com.zool.zeta. So there is a dependency between zoop and zeta. Nice and easy, nice and straightforward. We can also specify dependencies on modules in the JDK, so the, the standard core Java class libraries. In this case, I'm saying that app, my new app, has a dependency on Zoop. It also has dependency on the SQL module. So there are a bunch of modules which we'll talk about, but 
for now, we'll just say, OK, there's a Java.SQL module. What that allows us to do is to build a dependency graph. So we can say that my app depends on Zoop. But we know Zoop depends on Zeta, and my app depends on Java.SQL. Now, all modules have a dependency implicit on Java.Base. So Java.Base contains the most fundamental classes that you need in Java to do anything. So like the class loader, security manager, and so on. So there is an implicit dependency between all our modules and Java.Base. And then we'll find that if we follow that and look at it further, Java.SQL has dependencies on Java.XML, and it has dependencies on Java.Logging. And again, they have an implicit dependency on Java.Base. So that gives us a dependency graph. But then we also need to understand the difference between dependency and readability. So here's an example. I've got my app, which depends on Java.SQL. Java.SQL has dependency on Java.Logging. And if I look at some code that I might write, in my app, I might get a reference to a JDBC driver. And then from that driver, I can get a reference to a logger. And then I can log some information. The problem we have here is that my app has a dependency, explicit dependency, on SQL. But there's no dependency defined explicitly between app and logging. So when it comes time to resolve the logger class, the compiler and the runtime would be a bit stuck, because they go, well, Java SQL doesn't contain that, so how do I get a reference to it? Now, what we could do is we could say, well, OK, I have to remember that in my app module dependency, I've got to put a dependency on Java.logging. But that's kind of a bit messy. So there's a better way of doing that. What we can actually do is we can say that module Java.SQL requires Java.logging, but it's going to be a public dependency, which means that all the classes which are exposed from Java.logging will be exposed to anything which has a dependency on Java.SQL. So my app, because it depends on Java.SQL, will also be able to see anything which is included publicly in Java.logging. So we don't have to explicitly put it in our dependency from our application code. What this then allows us to do is to build up the readability graph rather than just a dependency graph. So we've still got the same things that we saw before, app, zoop, zeta, SQL, base. And then if we look at XML and logging, because they have this implicit dependency through the public modifier on our dependency, those are visible, those are visible to our app through an implied dependency. So that solves the problem of the, that sort of situation. We then have package visibility. So in this case, what I can do is I can say, well, I've got these packages in my module. And I don't want to make all of those publicly available to anything that depends on my module. So in the case of Zoop, I'm still saying that I require Zeta. But this time, rather than exporting or exposing all of the, the module or all the packages that I've got inside Zoop to other people, I'm going to say that I only want to export alpha, and I only want to export beta. There's another package in there called theta. And because I haven't explicitly said that it exports it, then it won't be visible to anybody who has a dependency on Zoop. If I don't put any exports in there at all, all of the packages will automatically be exported. So it's only if I specify individual ones, those ones will be exported, and anything else will not be exported. And what this brings us to is the idea of a sort of two-stage two thing in terms of whether a package is visible from one module to another. And in order for that package to be visible, firstly, it has to be exported from a module. And then the module that wants to use it also has to specify a dependency on that module. So there's two things that have to be satisfied. Firstly, that it is exported. And secondly, that there is a dependency created between those two modules. Once that is the case, all of the public types from those packages so we're not changing any of the private, any of the protected situation. All of the public things from those packages will be available, will be visible to the other module. And this is quite important because this changes things in terms of Java 
the language a bit. So we're used to accessibility modifiers. We know that we have the idea of public, we have protected, we have package modifier where we don't specify anything, and then we have private. And that's the sort of decreasing level of visibility. What we now have is public doesn't quite mean public in the same way. We have the idea of public to everyone, because you're exporting the public types in a particular package to anybody through exporting all of the, the public types. Public to only specific modules, because one of the things I haven't shown you is you can actually say, I want to make this thing public, but only to certain packages. So even though another package might have a dependency on it, you can restrict which packages have visibility on that. And then you can say it's only public within a module because you haven't exported it outside of that module. And so in this case, public now doesn't necessarily mean accessible in the same way that it did. And that, I think, is actually quite a fundamental change to the way Java works. So JDK 8 and dependencies. This is a very simple graph of the dependencies between the different parts or packages within JDK 8. And this posed a bit of a problem. Because what the designers of Jigsaw wanted to do in JDK 9 was obviously break up the class libraries and make them into smaller chunks. Now, if we zoom in, because you obviously can't read that, I can't even read that from here. So if we zoom in a bit, what we find is, and this might still be hard to read, but don't worry, um, JAX-WS is at the top. So that's a package which deals with web services. And there's a line in the graph which shows it has dependency on the Beans package. OK, that's fair enough. You know, JAX-WS uses the Beans package. Great. But then we can also look at another bit here, and we can see that the Beans package here is related to the desktop package. So the desktop package has a, a line in the graph which says it has a dependency on Beans. OK, again, you know, so desktop package uses the Beans package. But the line goes both ways. So you think, hang on, so the Beans package has dependency on desktop. How does that work? And how do we break up things? Because there's all these dependencies between different things. And it turns out that in the Beans package, when it was created, there is a set of things about Bean properties. So there's things like the name and so on. And one of the things that thought people thought would be nice to add to the Beans properties was the idea of a little icon, you know, a graphical representation of that Bean, which needs something from AWT in order to represent that icon. So then now there's this link between the two. And that's the kind of thing that gets really difficult in terms of breaking up the existing libraries, because they've evolved over time and they've kind of morphed. Um, so that's the sort of thing that needs to be broken up. And what we end up with is a, is a much simpler graph. Uh, again, don't worry about trying to read that, because again, it's kind of eye chart stuff. But there's, there's a bunch of different packages that have been created in, or modules, I should say, a bunch of different modules which have been created in JDK 9. So you have crypto, you have preferences, there's data transfer, XML, and so on. But that's essentially what's happened now, is they've managed to break these things up. And that goes back to those six APIs that are being removed, the property change listeners, which are the things that specifically need to be removed to break some of these dependencies. So let's look at how you can develop code with modules. So the first thing is simply compiling things. So I said that you have to have your module info.java file. So all you need to do is specify when you compile your code that you want to compile the module info.java file. That creates a module info.class file, and then you can create that as a module. So that's the, the simplest part of that. When you want to compile, you can also use a module path. So remember, the idea is to move away from class path hell. So now we're going to use, rather than a class path, we're going to use a module path. So you can have module path that has a number of directories on it, that has a number of modules in it, and then when you want to resolve things, the module path will be searched to find the modules, and the necessary classes will be loaded from the packages. If we want to compile with the module path, then we specify Java C minus module path, where the module path is, and we specify what we're doing, and obviously if things need to be resolved, then they can be resolved against the module path. So I'm sure you're thinking to yourself, well, okay, so now we've got a module path rather than the class path. How does that actually change anything? Because it's still just a bunch of like directory names, and we're still having to resolve things. Bear with me. When we want to execute our application, it still looks very similar. We're saying Java, but now rather than minus CP for class path, we say minus MP for module path. Major, major improvement there. Um, 
And we can also specify the module. So now we don't actually have to specify the, the, the necessary, like, well, we can specify where the main class is coming from. So where the module is and where the main class comes from. Again, still looks very similar to what we had before, not really doing anything to improve our life at all. Again, bear with me. Packaging. OK. How do we create modules? This is the kind of big thing here. Modular jar files is one of the primary ways of doing this. In fact, probably the primary way of doing this. So you can take your jar file that you have at the moment. If you want to create a module from it, all you need to do is include in there the module info.class. So once that's in there, when the runtime, the JVM, uses that, it will look at it and go, oh, it's a jar file, but it's got a module info.class file in it. That gives me information about the module. I will treat that as a module rather than just a plain old jar file. And so you can create your modular jar file just by using jar, by just by create, minus file, blah, 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 and put the module in there and so on. And then if you do minus p with jar, which is a new flag that they've included, you'll find the information about the module. So it'll give you the name of the module. It will give you the things that it requires, so zeta, base, SQL. And it will also give you the main class that's going to get executed, which then allows you to simplify things a bit by saying, OK, if we're going to run this, simply say Java minus MP, where the module is coming from, and then the module that you want to actually run. And the main file will be actually extracted from that, and then it will actually run the code. To make life a bit simpler, you can also use JLink. And JLink is sort of like linking, but you know, it's not really linking. Because for me, linking is like when I write C code and you create object files, and then you link those together to create an executable. It's sort of like that. But what we're doing with Java is we're saying, OK, let's build an executable which embeds the Java runtime. So you will have the JVM. You will have a, a runtime image, which will have your bin directory with the JVM. It'll have your conf directory. It'll have lib directory. But only the modules which you specify will be placed in the lib directory. So it allows you to eliminate any modules that you don't need. So in the case of Corba, for example, you don't need to put Corba in there if you're not using it. And if you create a very, very simple one, which has just got java.base in it, then if you do list mods on that, you will find that it's just got java.base. If we make that a little bit more interesting and we use our example application, what we'll find is that we'll do JLink with our app. And then if we list the mods on there, we'll find base, logging, SQL, XML, which are all the standard ones, app, zoop, and zeta. And what you might also notice is that there's this numbering thing here. So at 9.0, at 1.0. So you get awfully excited and you go, oh, look, we've got versioning at last. Actually, no. Versioning numbering here is for information purposes only. And I've actually quoted from the, the state of the module system, which is the document written by Mike, Mark Reinhold and so on. And it says, it is not a goal of the module system to solve the version selection problem. So those are there just for you to look at and think those are nice. But they don't actually make any difference in terms of resolving things and having multiple versions and so on. Application migration, also very important. So this is a typical application in JDK 8. So we've got our monolithic JDK at the bottom. We have a bunch of third-party jar files that we've used for frameworks and so on. And then we've got our jar files that we created for our own application code. And when it comes to putting this all together, what we do is we use the class path. And the class path tells us that these jar files need to be on the class path. And so the runtime can then locate the different classes that we want either in the JDK or on the class path. So how do we take this and move it to JDK 9? Because, of course, the idea is that we're moving to a module system. So now the monolithic JDK is broken up into a bunch of modules. How do these jar files work with modules? Now, I did talk about modular jar files, but let's assume we haven't made any changes to our jar files, we haven't created module info.jar classes and put them in the jar files. So how does that work? Well, it's actually very simple. All of the things on the class path become one module. All of the things on the class path become the unnamed module. So if you want to take an existing application and run it on JDK 9, you don't have to change anything. You can simply specify your class path exactly as you did before, have all your jar files on there, 
And the runtime will say, oh, OK, we'll treat all of those things on the class path as one unnamed module. And therefore, all dependencies on anything in the JDK will be resolved because there will be an explicit dependency between the unnamed module and all of the modules in the JDK. So all things get resolved. You cannot specify a dependency on the unnamed module. So you can't have one module saying, well, OK, I'm going to depend on things which are in the unnamed module, which effectively are on the class path. So this is a one-way thing only, which allows you to take existing code and simply drop it into JDK 9, and it will run without any changes. So let's look at how we might take a sample application, a little bit simpler, and do some things with that. So here we've got an application which has an application library, and it's got three third-party JAR files for some sort of graphical thing. Now, what we can do is we can run that with our class path. So here is our class path hell, where we've got lots of different JAR files on our class path, and then we run our application. So the first thing we can do is we can say, right, well, I'm going to take my app and my lib JAR files, and I'm going to turn them into modules by putting a module info.class file in there, and I will make them proper modules. So now they're not part of the unnamed module. Don't need to put them on the module path. Hmm. OK, but when I specify my dependencies, I'm going to have to require LWJGL. I'm going to have to require GlueGen, Joggle, and so on. But how do I do that? Because remember, I can't specify a dependency on the unnamed module. So how do I say that I do need these things without actually having them as a proper module? Now, what I could do is I could say, well, OK, well, let's take those jar files, take them apart, put a module info.class file in there, rebuild them, and so on. But that's, that's kind of messy. We don't want to do that. We really just want to use them because they're third-party jar files. So you can build the dependency graph between all these things, but that's still not quite going to solve the problem. Well, there's another thing which is called automatic modules. Automatic modules are if you put a jar file rather than on the class path, if you put it on the module path. If that jar file doesn't have a module info.class file in it, so it's just a raw jar file, then it will be treated as an automatic module. Its name will be derived from the name of the jar file. It won't have the ability to specify any dependencies on other modules, so it will have to basically depend on everything. And it will export all of the packages that are available in there. So there's no, again, ability to specify only certain packages being exported. So again, this gets around the issue of taking existing jar files and putting them into the module path. What that allows us to do is to create a, a slightly more complicated module dependency graph. And I think I've got all the arrows that actually needed to be in there, because of course the ones in the middle depend on everything. So they all have to depend on those. But it does simplify our class path help. So we can actually take all that class path away and simply say, right, now the module path is this directory where all those jar files are, and it will work. So now we start to see how it does get a bit simpler with the module path versus the class path. Right, advanced stuff. So I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about this, because there are a few things to be aware of. One is modular jar files and jmods. So a long time ago in, in Jigsaw, the proposal was that everything as a module would be a jmod file. And that was going to be a different file format. But to make it easier to migrate from existing applications, the decision was made to use modular jar files. But there is still the idea of a jmod. So if you look at the actual JDK itself, and you look in the, the lib directory, what you'll find is a bunch of jmod files. They're a little bit more complex than module files. Um, so that these are the ones that can include native code. So you can put native libraries in there if you want. You can have configuration files. You can have other data. At the moment, it's based on a zip file format rather than a jar file format. Um, there's some things in JEP 261 which talk in about this in a bit more detail as to what you can actually do with it. But it is the idea that you can either use a modular jar file with or without a module info.class file, or you can use a jmod file. And you can actually use a jmod file in your own code. So there is a jmod command which will allow you to create, list, or describe jmod files. If you want to create a jmod file, then you specify a main class, or you can specify a main class. You can specify native libraries and commands if you want to include them. You can specify configuration data. You can specify things like the operating system name. You can specify a version for the operating system. You can even specify an architecture for the machine. 
and those will automatically be included into the module info.class file. So you don't have to explicitly put them in there. You can do it when you create the JMOD. Class loaders. So if we look at the way class loaders work, basically since JDK 1.2, there's sort of three levels of class loader. You've got your application class loader, which is an instance of URL class loader. And that's what basically interrogates the class path. So anything that you want to load from the class path is done through the application class loader. There's also a second level above that, which is the extension class loader. This comes back to what I was talking about before, where in terms of the extension mechanism, that's available. It's part of the, uh, the um, facilities. It's also an instance of the URL class loader. And then the primary class loader, if you like, is the bootstrap class loader. And that's the thing in the JVM, which actually loads all of the classes that are part of rt.jar. And you've also got the bootstrap class path. So if you want to change that, you can change where the primary classes come from. In JDK 9, that changes a bit. So what's happening is that there's still going to be three, but the extension class load has gone away, kind of, and it's been replaced by the platform class loader. So now what happens is that you've still got the application class loader, not an instance of URL class loader. It's an internal class now. That loads the classes and the modules, so it deals with class path and module path, so a bit different there. You've then got the platform class loader, which deals with loading classes from the standard class libraries, but ones which have a restricted set of permissions. Because now the bootstrap class loader and the bootstrap class path itself has gone away. Well, kind of. There's actually one way you can still do that. But the bootstrap class path, is, is, to all intents and purposes, has gone away. The bootstrap class loader will load classes and give them full permissions. The idea then is that the platform class loader, for ones which don't need full permission, again, improving security, reducing the tax surface, um, use the platform class loader, and then application code gets loaded through the application class loader. Summary and further information. Um, tooling support is an interesting thing. So NetBeans has already started doing early access builds for JDK 9. Um, who uses NetBeans? Hmm, not many people. Um, who uses Eclipse? Hmm, who uses IntelliJ? Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting to see that that number has changed, because it used to be lots of people used Eclipse. Now it's IntelliJ. IntelliJ is definitely the most popular at the moment. NetBeans, not so much. Um, but they have done some interesting work around being able to graph dependencies and so on. So I was going to show you a demo, but I realized that the screen is a bit small for that. So I've kind of just done a quick screenshot of some of that. So it will actually draw the dependency graph for you. So you can create your module info.java file, and then it will actually show you the dependency graph. Um, could be a bit tidier, and uh, hopefully that'll improve that a bit. Summary then. Um, modularization, big change for Java, JVM, JRE rather than languages, rather than the APIs specifically. Some potentially disruptive changes because of the things that break backwards compatibility, um, the whole thing around sun, misc, unsafe, things that you do need to be aware of. Um, developing modular code will require a bit more learning about things. It's not a huge change, but you know there are some things you need to be aware of. Um, with one minute to go, um, I will mention Zulu.org because I work for Azul, and Zulu.org is one of our sort of projects. This is basically our build of the OpenJDK source code. So we provide a free binary of the OpenJDK code, which passes all the TCK tests because we have access to the TCK. It's completely free. We will quite happily take your money if you want to pay for us for support. Um, and we're also doing Zulu on embedded devices now. So we just recently released uh, an ARM 32-bit. And the most interesting thing about that is it requires no licensing fee. Again, we will take your money if you want to pay us. Further information, openjdk.java.net. Um, there's also the JEPS on there, which are the JDK enhancement proposals. Project Jigsaw is under there as well. JCP.org has got a lot of information about what's actually happening in terms of the progression of the JSRs and so on. And ah, bang on time. There you go. Questions. Just goes red. Um, yeah, so I guess I have run out of time. If people have got questions, I would suggest that I'll be here uh, or just outside. So probably easier if you, if you give me questions then. So thank you very much.